So today on the Conscious Commerce podcast, I am joined by Kate Hamilton, who's the co-founder and story director at Sonder and Tell. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Ellie, for having me. I'm excited to be talking to you this morning or this evening for you. But yeah, today. (laughs) Opposite sides of the world. (laughs) Um, So we start off the podcast by getting to know you as a person a little bit better. So what's a fun fact about you that not many people know or do you have a party trick? I feel like the fun fact is maybe linked to my party trick which anyway so I used to live in Alabama when I was younger in the south in like the very deep south USA um because my dad had a job that was posted there so I was this real like southern belle um and like went to bible camp and like wore dungarees and um yeah it was just really southern and then it's linked to my party trick which I'm kind of nervous to say because I know what the next question will be but um I'm quite good at accents (laughs) <laughs> okay but a, a southern american accent or any sort of accent um well i could do alabama but my i can do like northern irish liverpool a okay few different well, ones. well let's hear the southern alabama one well it's a little bit like this it's kind of a draw like you have to go real <laughs> slow and make the vowels real open <laughs> so there you go <laughs> That's amazing. That's like such a juxtaposition from the English last I'm looking at right now on video. So that's I know, really cool to I hear. Know. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. And No Issues community is from all across the globe. So we like to give people a sense of where our interviewees come from. So where do you call home in the world and what's great about it? Yeah, so I grew up, I mean, kind of linked to the last question, I grew up in different places. Um in the world in Hong Kong, America, different parts of the UK. Um, So I don't have a sense of home in terms of the place that I grew up, but now I call London home and it's actually the place that I've been for the longest. Um, And I kind of love that anyone can do that. I think you can come from wherever and just live in London and suddenly call it home. Um, And although it's kind of been, well, definitely been compromised in the last year with lockdowns and things in general, I think it's the energy um, that I love about it in that sense that the world kind of orbits around it, even though I'm sure lots of people wouldn't agree with me in that sense. But um, yeah, just the sense that kind of anything can happen. Uh, Yeah. Although, yeah, I think lockdown, people are thinking of moving out and having more space, but I still love it. What, how would you describe London to someone that's never been there? Um, I keep coming back to this word energy, but yeah, it is energetic, um, which also means it's hectic. Um, but I think it's quite open as well. Um, I think British people, although can be a little bit stiff, I think there is a there is still the kind of openness and friendliness in some, well, definitely compared to somewhere like New York. Um, people will help you out a little bit more. And I love London also feels like it's made up of all these different villages. Like I love that you can go from, uh, I don't know, Columbia Road in Hackney to... Peckham and South London to where the Hampstead Heath Ponds are and they all feel like very different places um and architecture as well it's amazing you just feel like you're walking through history and if you weren't hitting up Sondra and Tell what industry or job do you think you'd be working in so I think if I'd n- never gone and set up Sondra and Tell I was a trap well I was a travel journalist before um at a magazine called Suitcase and I think I probably would still be not necessarily out Suitcase but I'd probably still be in journalism so I I guess it's similar in that I'd still be working with words and writing and editing um, but for editorial publications rather than for brands Um, although I think that's changed now if tomorrow I had to leave Sondra and Tell I would stay in the kind of brand writing space rather than editorial um journalism although they're so the skill set's quite interchangeable in some ways because you're always kind of interrogating a story um asking who your target audience should be and um how you should write and tailor things to them yeah I come from a journalism background as well so I totally resonate with everything you're saying and I as a child I think a certain type of person comes into these kind of jobs as well because I used to read the dictionary as a kid and I don't think that's... <laughs> I love that. That's so I don't nerdy. think that's normal. Yeah, that's <laughs> super nerdy. Um, so when I was introduced to Sondra and Tell as a brand, I was like, oh my gosh, I love this because it's perfect for language nerds like myself. So where do you think your love for words and storytelling began? Yeah, I think I was 
well like you reading the dictionary I was always one of those kids who kind of wrote stories and read a lot um furiously kept diaries as a child and teenager which are hilarious to read now especially the Alabama years kind of like complaining about boys who wouldn't kiss me and stuff like that with like incredible self-confidence um (laughs) but I think aside from that um there was a time when I was at school do you do you know innocent smoothies the um they make smoothies and plant-based milk now as well but they are kind of in the UK people reference them a lot because they have this very kind of cute and cuddly tone of voice and they were one of the first brands to do that um anyway when I was at school my friends and I always would loved innocent smoothies and would always buy them and read the back of the pack and then we wrote we wrote to them um and said something like oh we've just um yeah we love your drinks and signed off pie face and tea cake I'm not really sure why anyway they wrote back to us and we're like oh we've just eaten some of your friends for lunch and that was the first time that I kind of got even though I didn't clock that at the time but that was the first kind of time I remember brand communications and like brands having a tone of voice and a story and being able to engage with them as if they were a human because we literally wrote to Innocent and we were like wow they've replied I Um, love that they wrote back to you as well (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. um no they're very like that their social media is worth checking out they're in um Twitter they're really funny do you get writer's block um yes I just read this quote the other day from one of our interviewees um Pandora Sykes who's like you don't have writer's block you have a deadline which I thought was such a good way of (laughs) um getting over it yes but I tend to get out of it by reading so I think that's so useful um if you're struggling to come up with creative ideas, just read someone else's, not to say that you're going to copy them, but it will it can kind of get you out of the funk of, um, I can't think of anything at all. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's very good advice. And how did you and Emily meet and then decided that you wanted to run a business together? Um, yeah, so Emily and I met in Barcelona. Um, we were both studying Spanish at university um, and we just kind of hit it off straight away. We both had weird things in common, like we both lived in America, both loved kind of writing for magazines. Um, and Emily at the time was had started writing a column for Suitcase, which then was sort of an online blog. Um, so, and it was called Buena Vida. She started it in Barcelona. I then moved to Madrid and picked up the other half of her column. So we sort of alternated about life in Spain. Um, and then when we graduated, we both went to work for Suitcase full time. So um, that's where we sort of met and our relationship grew. And I think while we were at Suitcase, we just had a sense that we worked well as a partnership. And, she, you know, I would come to her with ideas and she would ask me to edit things. Um, and we just had a good kind of rhythm and sense of flow. Um, and Emily headed up Suitcase's agency. I was editor in chief there. Um, but I think she was seeing definitely the world of brand content could be um, could benefit from like a lot of the journalistic skills that we had. Um, so that's when we decided to kind of jump ship and do our own thing. Can you share the inspiration behind the name Sondra and Tell? Yes, so it took us so long to name our business, which I think is probably when you build a business uh, about the importance of words. And if you think of your name as like the distillation of all of your words. Yeah, there's (laughs) Um, so so much pressure riding on it. (laughs) Exactly, yeah, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves. Um, But anyway, we finally came across this word called Sonda, which a friend sent to me. Um, And it's there's a linguist in the US called John Koenig, and he's started this project called the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. And what he was trying to do was um, find language or making up words for human emotions that didn't have language yet. So um, one of the words was Sonder, and it means the moment of realization when um, the moment, sorry, the moment you realize that everyone around you has their own story. So it's like when you know, pre-COVID, if you've been on, been on the bus or the tube and you kind of look around and you're like, oh, I wonder what that person's thinking about or, or that person must have something interesting about them or I wonder what they're, yeah, they must get sad sometimes. So it's kind of tuning into people around you, realizing that everyone has their own story to tell. So there's that idea and then we help, we help them tell it. Um, so that's it really. And then it's also sort of a kind of play on the very corporate thing of naming your naming your business after your two last names, because it kind of sounds like Sonder and Tell. Some people are like, oh, is that your last name? Um, which it isn't, <laughs> but it's kind of a tongue in cheek reference to that. 
Yeah, but that is a really beautiful definition for a word as well. And at what moment did you and Emily know that you were onto a good thing with your business? Yeah, so there wasn't one light bulb moment. It was more of a kind of gradual realization that actually this is really what we're doing is good and it's really valuable. Um, and I think it came when we started working with a couple of smaller startups and what we initially set out to do was help brands become publishers and then help them craft their sort of brand story and tone of voice. Um, but I think what we realized is that once we started getting people's story right and they were able to implement it, it actually helped so many other things than just marketing. Because um, there was one startup who we've worked with recently called Home Things, who are um, direct consumer cleaning products with glass bottles and dissolvable tablets. We helped them create their brand story, but they actually use that brand story to craft their pitches for investors. Um, and it, it almost informed a lot of their sort of some of their business decisions as well as their brand ones. Um, and We've also seen the power of a story, not just to be able to communicate with customers, but for whole teams to suddenly understand what a business is about. And internally, you can really rally behind a good story or a good positioning. Um, so it kind of started with smaller brands and then we, we now do it for bigger brands. But I think it's that it was that realization that stories aren't just something that should sit in your marketing team. Uh, if you get them right and your tone of voice, too, then it can actually have this kind of impact across all different areas of your business. Yeah, it's very holistic. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to give a shout out to two great pieces of content of yours. So I first heard about Sandra and Tal when you wrote an awesome blog post called uh, for us called You're About Us Isn't Really About You, which was super well read and super well written. And then I subscribed to your newsletter called The Word and you broke down Bridgerton and its use of newsletters in a modern context, how to write a great EDM. And I just think for anyone interested in brand storytelling or language, you guys are a must follow. So yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out there. But from one content creator to another, we know how important it is for brands to tell a story that engages their audience. But there's also so much content out there online. It's absolutely saturated. So how exactly do you help brands express themselves uniquely? Yeah, um, thank you for shouting out the word, by the way. Um, <laughs> we put a lot of time into that. So that's great that you're enjoying it and Bridgerton too, obviously. Um, <laughs> so for a story to be unique, it has to be um, rooted in something that's unique about you. Um, and that we tend to use brand positionings to frame a story. Um, so they need to, they also need to be true, right? So it has to be ownable and it has to be genuine. Um, so we, we tend to look at consumer truths, product truths and brand truths to figure out the kind of role that you play in your customer's life. So your consumer truth is a kind of insight that you might have about your customer into the problem that they're that they're um, experiencing. So it could be, um, I want to make a dent on the single use plastic problem, but I don't want it to really inconvenience my lifestyle, for example. Um, then look at your product truth as the kind of answer to that. So your product truth could be, um, you know, well, I'm just using home things here as an example. Um, we have a uh, direct to consumer cleaning products, um, which are delivered to your door. So you don't have to kind of cycle to the refill store, for example. And then your brand truth is all about the world that you believe in, your values, um, and what you are about beyond just selling products. Um, so for home things, we did a lot of work into that, but it became this narrative of single use plastic is bonkers, home things make sense. So um, it's like there are so many things that are going on that are mad in the world. The single use plastic problem in your own home doesn't have to be one of them. We can help you kind of address that. Um, so I think it's about rooting your story in your positioning um, and you need to make sure that those truths are different from all of your competitors that no one else in your space could be saying those things um, and then use them to kind of build off build off your story. And what are some common mistakes you see with brand storytelling that could be quite easily avoided? Yeah, I think the biggest one, which I mentioned in that blog post, is not making the customer the hero of your story and making your brand or it's often your founder the hero of the story, which I think is a very common pitfall especially for smaller brands who perhaps haven't built up this whole team and architecture perhaps you are only three people and it's very natural um 
to go to your about us and you know say I started this business because I felt this this and this actually you need to flip that and ask yourself what is the customer getting out of your business what problem are you solving for them and how can you position that so you can even start with the problem to get right into the customer's headspace outline that and then show how your product is addressing it but just never start kind of i i i um i think the other problem is just not committing to a positioning um and trying to say 20 million things at once um, and I think it can feel scary because when you are the founder or when, you know, you've put a ton of work into something, you obviously think it's interesting in 10 different ways. And you're like, oh, no, but we've got this stitching and this material and this, this. Um, ultimately, customers don't care as much as you do. And it's almost like, what is that one thing that we can hammer home that we do better than anyone else that we're going to be remembered for, recognized for, and that people can then repeat about us? Um, and I think people get a bit icky about committing to one thing and of course you can build a nuance later but I just think in terms of your position and your story it's it's got to be really clear and defined yeah and I think with like the amount of channels that are out there from digital to offline people do sometimes get a bit confused with the messaging across the different platforms and don't have that consistency so getting that one strong message to hone in on across all platforms is so key right yeah and when you do it well you then see your customers repeating your messages at each other and spreading the word um in that way which is amazing to see we have we've worked with a small startup food brand lately um and they've really just taken the story and they say it over and over every day and then we've been looking at their tagged post it's all about independent um supporting independent food suppliers um with this recipe box that they've created it's called on the table um but when you look at their kind of tag posts and people people sharing stories about them it's all like the best independent produce boxed up supporting the butcher the baker the natural winemaker which is all stuff that they've been saying so it's obviously just sticking in customers minds and then they're repeating it back which is what you want yeah would you say that's a sign of success when the customer's repeating the messaging back to the brand yeah repeating it back but also making it their own as well right like you, I'm, I'm sorry I don't mean that as a kind of robotic thing but like they've assimilated it and now it's part of their story and I think that's what happens with storytelling is um there's this thing called um I can't remember the neural mirroring or something like that and it's when you recognize a story so if you were telling me a story I enjoy it um take it on board and then I'm gonna go and tell it to someone else tomorrow as if it was my own um and that I think it's called coupling and that's what happens with good brand stories as well as like the customer takes it on and then they're going to repeat it as if it's as if it's theirs so yeah that, but they might that change definitely... some of the details in terms of their own experience as well exactly yeah yeah but the essence is still there yeah yeah what advice do you give new businesses who are struggling to nail their story I think the positioning piece is a little can be a little bit complex so thinking about your consumer truth and your product truth but I think if in really simple terms if you think about the starting with a problem and a solution I think that's a really good framework to think about um, and actually it's the basis of any good story right it's like Harry Potter his problem is Voldemort <laughs> he goes on a quest <laughs> to kind of get rid of the problem it's the basis of any good plot so start with the the problem that you think your customers are experiencing um we often try and break problems down into two parts so there's the external problem which is the kind of world trigger um so for example it could be i want to make a dent on the single use plastic problem but then there's an internal problem which is how your customer feels about it um so that could be something like but i don't want it to really inconvenience my life um so I think brands often sell to the external problem, but you want to think about how you can tap into those internal feelings as well um, and also kind of speak, speak on that emotional level to your customer. Um, so, yeah, customer's problem, your solution, which is your product, how you're going to take this customer, your hero on a journey to help them overcome this. Yeah, I think that's a great point, especially with um, sustainable brands, because people will often say, I want to support ethical brands, sustainable brands, um, that's the option I'll opt for. But then when push comes to shove, maybe their behavior doesn't actually reflect that. So that's those two clashing areas, right? 
Yeah. And is it is that because they're confused? And if so, perhaps part of your solution and your brand tone of voice has to be about clarity and helping them make these decisions? Or is it because they um, don't understand it, in which case it has to be more about giving them the right information so they can make an informed decision? Um, Or is it because they feel scared? And in that case, it's because you have to kind of reassure them a little bit. So that um, internal problem, the feelings around it is quite useful in terms of framing a tone of voice as well. Um, And I think the other point for new businesses if you can afford to getting a copywriter in earlier um even to work with you on on just the brand story i think is always a good idea because i think if you can get the words right then they can end up you know informing so many other parts of the business and i know sometimes it's not something that people want to spend money on early doors but even if it was you know a freelancer who you trust who can help you kind of go back and forth with these narrative elements um because it's quite it's quite good to do it in collaboration then that could be really useful yeah because sometimes you can be too close to the brand right so it's good to get that third person perspective as well yeah exactly exactly you can be too into all of the intricacies of what you're doing um and you kind of need someone to almost play this external role of the customer and be like this is interesting say this don't say that leave that out um that's a really useful process. And you count some amazing businesses as clients from Airbnb and Bumble, Lick and Rude Health. So when it comes to communication, what do you think they're doing really well? Is it their brand story being linked to a strong sense of purpose? Yeah, so I think it's being linked to a strong sense of purpose and that point of positioning as well and that they've really committed to what they're about um so just to take bumble as a kind of top level example without sort of going into how we worked with them um but we always say that it's interesting because bumble exists in a sea of kind of dating apps so you've got um hinge tinder and bumble they're all there and yet they're all able to exist because they've really committed to their position and the role they play for their customer. So um, Bumble is for women to make the first move. um, And the whole idea is, you know, you make the first move in dating and then you can go on to do that in so many aspects of your life, whether it be friendships or careers, that's a confidence thing. Hinge is um, their tagline is designed to be deleted. So they're all about, you know, finding the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And then Tinder is for hookups. Um, so and they all they're all able to exist they're all solving that consumer problem of finding finding a partner but they all have different angles on that Um, so I think that's always really interesting to speak about with them and Bumble just over commit and over commit to that position of being for women I was Um, going to say I already know their tagline before you've said it because I've heard it so many times right the recall is there yeah, exactly. And it comes out in all the campaigns they do, which are always about kind of women um, cheering one another on and pepping pepping one another up. And it doesn't even have to be about dating. It's kind of just more about the confidence and empowerment message. Um, and one we've worked with recently is Root Health. Um, so they're a plant-based milk brand, um, which are big in the UK. Um, and they, when they came to us, they were essentially saying too many things at once. So we're natural, we're organic, we're healthy we're British we're wholesome all these different things um, and we help them refine their position um, around flavor so I think uh, when you've got someone like Oatly who's essentially trying to match milk um, Rude Health is actually the more delicious option they're kind of bringing in all these this new world of flavor um, and foodiness to plant-based milk which isn't there yet um so we kind of called their positioning the bright way and then they've used that as a kind of um north star for their brand storytelling sense so we are we've written a newsletter for them called um bright relief which is all about a kind of bright alternative to your news cycle in the same way that their plant-based um milks are a bright alternative to dairy so it's kind of finding that territory that you're going to own and then pulling things off of it um And that's also impacted the language they use because that should also come out of their positioning. Another really good brand for tone of voice is there's this water water in a can called Liquid Death. Um, And if you think about the kind of category conventions of water, um, that's that it comes in a plastic bottle, that it's all about vibrancy. Um, They are challenging that because obviously they put water in aluminium cans as an environmental thing. They've called it 
they flipped the whole kind of convention and then so therefore they flipped the language and it becomes liquid death, murder your thirst, <laughs> um, which I just think is really clever. Yeah, that's awesome storytelling. Is there any other brands you're admiring right now for their use of language? Um, I think Bloom and Wild, who are a flower delivery service um, in Europe, are doing a really good job. So I think their tag is, it's when you know, don't just send flowers, care wildly. Um, and they have this kind of thoughtful marketing um, initiative where you can opt in or out to, to um things like Mother's Day campaigns, um, if you find it triggering. So they're doing, they're taking the idea of caring wildly and making sure that they, as a brand, go above and beyond to care for their customers. Um, I really like Starface as well. I don't know if you've heard of them. They are a super Gen Z, um, it's essentially for acne. So they have these little pimple spots in the shape of stars that you put on spots um, to dry them out and help your skin. Um, but they and they, they come in the shape of a star and they've made it almost cool to wear spot patches on your face. Um, yeah, I was going to say that's just, very Gen Z. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's just so tapped. I don't know who their social, who does their social, but they're so hot on every trend. Um, and their brand story on their website as well is this kind of star face story. So it's like a long time in a galaxy far, far away. There was a war on acne um, and it's just really fun. <laughs> It's it's really fun. I always feel really old looking at their stuff, though. I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> how I feel boomer. about TikTok. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like such a boomer. Um, <laughs> who else? There's uh, there's a um, what's it called? A fake meat company called This, um, which is doing really well and their whole thing is this is this isn't so they did a marketing campaign a couple of years ago where they got a fake um Ed Sheeran to, to serve to serve their kind of fake burgers um but he looked so much like Ed Sheeran that they had this whole kind of um streams of people down the street queuing to meet Ed Sheeran and then you got up close you're like this isn't Ed Sheeran and <laughs> the whole thing was like this isn't me either so they do really fun stuff that's genius <laughs> <laughs> it's so good and besides helping brands find their unique voice and helping your followers see the beauty of words, how are you building a sustainable agency? Um, well, I think our team personally, I mean, there's only four of us. So we're kind of, we're quite low impact at the moment. We're not in an office. None of us are commuting. We'll see how we um, how we go when the world kind of starts coming back to a bit of normality. Um, but I think more than that, it's probably in the way that we communicate with brands that we work with and what we encourage them to do because I think from the start we've always said that we want brands to be more than just about selling a product um, and encouraging them to build their own positive culture beyond just making something Um, so it might not even be directly um, sustainability in the environmental sense but it could be you know if you're a book platform can you support um, children's literacy Mm. Is it International Women's Day there at the moment or has was that yes, yesterday? yesterday? Yesterday, yeah. Because something I noticed was how many bands brands were jumping on the bandwagon for International Women's Day, but it was all the same message and it was like extremely fatiguing to just have it over and over again from a different companies. Like there wasn't really any new material in the storytelling there. It was just like celebrate women and that was it. Like Yeah. Did you find think- was that your experience? Yeah, I think International Women's Day has almost become a bit comical for that over the years because it is it becomes this thing of like, yay, yay, the girlies <laughs> without actually thinking, what are you doing to support women? Or, you know, are, are you making donations today? Or I think a lot of it as well. Um, we've worked with a sustainable fashion brand called Birdsong who have this meme um, that is like when you when you like post on International Women's Day, but you're but you don't, your workers don't have, your garment workers don't have rights or don't have minimum pay. It's that kind of thing. You need to make sure that you're supporting women at every level of your business um, and not just shouting out on International Women's Day because, yeah, it becomes this thing where you just feel like you have to have an opinion. And if it's not ingrained in your culture or in your, um, in the way that you kind of rigorously look at your products, then it doesn't, you shouldn't really be talking about it. Yeah, when people when businesses just jump on a trend, it's quite easy to see right through it, right? Like the 
there's not a deeper sense of storytelling or meaning there. It's just like a shout out yeah. on a single day. <laughs> yeah, or a slogan tea that just is boosting your profits but not actually doing anything meaningful. Yeah, exactly. I'm, so I think there was, I saw a lot of kind of tongue in cheek memes about it yesterday as well. So I don't know if consumers are also wising up to that because I feel like that's been quite gradual. It's like, okay, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> that was interesting to see. I'll have to look those memes up because I think I can relate to those. I was feeling yeah, very I'll send them to you. International Women's Day. Yeah. Um, and also when we talk about the the language around having a business purpose or even sustainability, I think it can get a little confusing for people and lost in the communication between people and brands. So have you seen businesses struggling to articulate their efforts in that area and what's your advice to them usually? Yeah, I think it's a tricky one, both from a business point of view and as a copywriter. Um, and it's I find it interesting because we've done quite a bit of work with FMCG food brands and um, doing bits of packaging copy. And when it comes to a message like health, there are so many things that you just can't say, um, at least in the UK and Europe. I don't, I'm sure it's the same with you, but um, you can't say healthy unless there's a specific health claim related to it on pack which makes sense to me because you don't want to mislead people there are so many regulations around yeah say this don't say this and then you come to a word like sustainability which is so broad but there's no regulations around it and anyone can say we're sustainable without the, any sort of parameters as to what it means or does it mean so I think the most um helpful thing that brands can do is is try and avoid these kind of high level claims of sustainability and try and get as specific as possible to signpost actually what that means for your brand. So is it um, that you use renewable materi materials or recyclable materials or is everything compostable? Um, and just try and give your consumers, or if you're using a word like sustainability, then, then just signpost it with the kind of details on what that actually means. Um, so that they can understand it a little bit more as well because even we worked with a client the other day and it's they were writing um it's industrial compostable was part of the claim and it sounded good looking at it and then we dug into what it means and it actually meant that you can't recycle you can't compost it unless you send it off to the council which in the uk is nearly impossible to do because they don't collect it so it's like okay maybe that's not the right message then so trying to be as helpful as possible to the consumer and giving them the information without overwhelming them is I think the best pack. yeah and it also defining as you said defining what it means to you as a business and the the actions you're taking to get there because I think it is such a broad umbrella term it's used to mean so many things so you've really got to distill it down to its essence yeah and you can just you don't have to say that you're say, say everything that you're doing at once we actually have an interview on our site with a um, impact strategist called Amira um, and she was like it's okay to say like we're doing these things and we're working on these things so you know people don't expect you to be perfect they just expect you to be clear yeah um, transparent and think, exactly and I think there's also something to be said for talking about um, your type of sustain sustainability in your own brand tone of voice because I think there's a real tendency for people to adopt a kind of quote-unquote serious or formal tone when they're talking about serious issues like conserving the planet but actually I think the bigger challenge is to do that in a way that feels like it's going to be relevant to your audience and don't be afraid of humor or things like that so home things is a good example of that because they've got this kind of challenging irreverent tone or Oatly right that's got a serious message but does it in this kind of dry witty way um so I think if you can be really clear on what you're what you want to say, but then try and say it in your own tone as well, without sort of making the customer feel like this is our serious section is a good way to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. And that leads quite nicely to my next question, because um, here at No Issue, we define sustainability as the ability to exist indefinitely and think long term about the future of our planet and of our businesses. Um, and as I was researching, I found that sustainability comes from the Latin word sustenere, which means to support, maintain or endure. So taking it right back to its origin. So, yeah, that's how we're defining it as a business. And 
the perspective we have on it. But how long term are you thinking with Sondra and Tal and the change that you want to see in the world? Yeah, it's a good time to ask this question, actually, as, as we've done some work with um, a future strategist this year. So looking at how the world of kind of brand communications is is going to shift. I think the biggest change that is kind of on our ra- radar is AI being developed and um, that kind of day to day copywriting before too long will probably be in the hands of machines rather than of people which for us is like okay so we is that does that mean we're out of business um so we're perhaps anticipating that shift but actually there's going to be even more need for people to be able to strategize about the kind of right um positioning and and creative concepts that go into tone even if it's not going to be a kind of human enacting them day to day so it's kind of helped us think about how we can future proof our business so it's perhaps front loading the sort of strategic creative concepts that go into a tone or a story and less the sort of actual implementing of you know uh day-to-day blog writing and that sort of thing is where we're going to try and get a little bit more work in the future yeah because I feel like we've seen so many of those articles like the robots are coming for your jobs but it's like when are they actually going to be here taking our jobs you know it's always been predicted but it hasn't happened but maybe it is actually getting that little bit closer now 2021 yeah, well, <laughs> I know well there was an I think there was a New York Times piece lately where they'd got a few different machines to write I think it was some versions of their love stories and they were really good <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of they're definitely getting smarter at simulating human writing um, so, so even romance novelists will be out of a job soon no well (laughs) yeah I guess it's like how you define kind of different versions of creativity I think what this impact strategist really helped us think was to try and think of these advances in tech as kind of allies so how can we how can we work with them rather than against them um the robots that is (laughs) um and I think that's more kind of we'd be in charge of there'd still be space for kind of strategizing around brands but perhaps the actual day-to-day quote unquote human copywriting will be less less important. Yeah. I think creativity is still very much the human domain, right? Like we'll always have um priority over robots for now anyway, in that sense and strategizing. Yeah. Yeah. Well we were we were talking about it and wondering if even that'll be um a, like almost a tag in the future, like a tag of pride it will be like written by humans or made <laughs> by humans, you know, even what well, how it's now like I don't know with no animal testing or something like that like a a consumer will buy into something that's made by a human not by a robot that's Um, a really interesting train of thought wow (laughs) I know we got quite deep this is probably I you know this is probably like 30 years in the future but we have been thinking about it and it has definitely shifted our mindset even how we approach brand stories we're like okay does this have longevity in it or is this gonna yeah well the question was like how long to me thinking I think you're thinking pretty long term which is good you're prepared <laughs> prepared for any outcome with the robots yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um has Sondra and Tal had a COVID pivot as such or has everything been business as normal we've been really lucky to be honest it's hard to know what business as normal would have been because we were still such a young or still are but a young agency starting out um so it's hard to know what, what a non- COVID Sonder would have been but I think I think that in a way brand communications especially digitally became more important than ever because a lot of brands had those face-to-face interactions with um, consumer whether it be in store or events um, or kind of marketing act- activations taken away so I think a lot of brands started asking about their tone of voice. And what's your advice for someone that wants to start a business around their unique set of talents but doesn't know where to begin? Yeah, if you don't know where to start, I think a good place is to actually look at the competition. So people who you think are doing things um, in a similar area, not to copy them, but to define yourself sort of against them. Um, So if they are saying this about themselves, then can you say something slightly different? Um, and yeah, if you're building a kind of service based business like an agency, then what can you stand for apart from your services? Um, and can you build a real niche? Um, like, can you be known for working with 
direct to consumer food brands, for instance. Um, yeah, and I think then you'll kind of build up a very specific audience around that, and those people can then communicate your your services as well. I'm not sure if you're asking about a service based business, but I think always looking at the competition is a good place to start in terms of what you want to be and don't want to be. Yeah, definitely. And how do you define success for Sandra and Tell and also for yourself personally? That's such a big question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sandra and Tell, we're, we'd love to build a world where every brand looks to words, language and stories as the starting point of brand building. We get um, quite a lot of briefs where people have gone to work with design agencies who have built out this kind of beautiful logo typeface color palette illustrations um which look amazing but then th- they've not thought about the tone of voice the story or if they have it's kind of annexed to a slide at the end which says your tone of voice should be kind of friendly authentic and human but they haven't gone deeper than that um so I think we're always kind of fighting for words to be really considered as early as possible um and I guess off the flip side of that is for us to have this team of super nimble copywriters and strategists who are like really valued for their their words and what they do um I think down the line as well we've spoken about potentially looking at opening a separate studio for much smaller businesses and founders who need who need words um and I guess for me personally it's success is kind of having that balance between strategy and creative as well and being able to kind of get lost in a concept in a world but then also kind of being a bit more I guess direct and which I'm starting to do now anyway but having uh foots in different parts of the business feet in different parts of the business yeah because do you think um brand storytelling hasn't been as much of a priority or are the times changing now I think I think the word storytelling is super broad as well, but I definitely think brand copywriting has copywriting, been. yeah, specifically yeah. The, the language, the tone. Definitely, I don't think yeah. I don't think language, tone, copywriting has been valued enough. I do think things are changing because I think consumers are becoming so much more discerning. Um, but I think it still is often an afterthought. We a really common brief for us is we've done the design; we just need some copy but it's never just the copy it's like okay if you don't have the copy or the tone then you don't really have a a strategy for how to communicate with your consumer um and I think that's the kind of argument that we really get on it's like start with the words if you can um lead with the words use that as a brief for design if you can you know if you there's so much power in the ability for a founder or um, a team member to be able to sum up exactly what you're doing in a sentence or a few words if you can do that then your whole team can get behind it you can have really focused team meetings that's one of the things um Rutel said to us is after we've done on their position they're like our Christmas brainstorm was so much easier because we had this kind of north star of what we were about rather than people just coming with these sort of random ideas Yeah, it's so true. Even for, you know, startups with their investor pitch, if they can nail their elevator pitch succinctly, then, you know, success will follow. Like the words are so important that you use as a company. Exactly. We always say you can't, you don't really understand something until you name it. And I think that is the same. It's like you can't really process an idea until you put words and language around it and can say it in a sentence or two. Um, So that's what we're trying to get all brands to to realize and sign up to yeah it's like my um former editor used to say um what would you tell your mum about this how would you explain it to your mum in simple terms and I was, that's always stuck with me like that is <laughs> I've always yeah, got to explain better. things to my mum yeah yeah like bitcoin to your mum or something I yeah. can't even that to myself <laughs> I, I can't even wrap my head around that either no. <laughs> well cool we'll leave that there but thank you so much for your time today Thank you, Ellie. It's been really lovely talking to you.